out to visit you. All yes. yours. So I understand that uh, Ted Deschler had come out some years ago and visited you in person. <laughs> back when that was the only way we did it pretty much and uh, told you about the vertebrates of Red Hill. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So this will be emphasizing the plants in the landscapes, although I have numerous slides of the, the vertebrates because I um, like to take the whole ecosystem approach, which for Red Hill, it's something that is possible to do. So that is one of the um, wonderful aspects of doing field work at Red Hill. And it's, it's uh, just enables one to interpret an ancient landscape back when a lot of terrestrial adaptations were being evolved amongst both the plants and the, um, the animals, vertebrates and invertebrates. So I'd like to couch my um, own research in terms of clearing up the misunderstandings about um, what the fish are terrestrial ancestors, the, uh, the iconic cartoon of the fish crawling out onto land, what it actually was seeing. And here's something from a New Yorker cartoon. And what are the plants that you see here? They look um, vaguely like palm trees and cattails and the issue with that is that they're, that's very anachronistic because they didn't uh, evolve until about 200 million years, around 200 million years after the um, early tetrapods were beginning to emerge onto land. And early attempts at making a scientific reconstruction was based on um, of course, fragmentary evidence. And when I say fragmentary, well, most fossils are fragmentary. And with plants, there's the added um, complication that uh, plants are modular. You can't really infer um, very well what the rest of the plant looks like whenever you just have a fragment, like you can quite often with, uh, with say, vertebrate fossils and some invertebrates where you can infer from um, just a few bones what perhaps the rest of the organism looks like based on uh, homologies with uh, related um, animals. But in plants, so for example, this is, a, I believe this is from the late 50s or early 60s, a beautiful reconstruction by Zinek Burian and um, probably mangling his name, but, um, what it's based on are interpretations of the evidence found of um, fossil wood called calyxalon and fossil, what was believed to have been ferns, which was given the name Archaeopteris, which you'd see in the mid distance here. And then in the, the far distance, you see some large um, lycopod trees or scale trees which uh, were first starting to get big in the late Devonian. And it wasn't until 1960 with a publication by Charles Beck uh, from out there in the Midwest from Michigan, who um, found, whoop, got a little ahead of myself here, um, who found connection between Calyxalon and um, Archaeopteris, that Archaeopteris was actually the foliage of Calyxalon and uh, more contemporary interpretations show these large trees, which are pro sperm trees, which were trees that had um, modern wood with bifacial cambium, and they would have had uh, seasonal rings, and some seasonal rings have been found in Calyxalon wood, but with uh, fern-like foliage and homosporous reproduction. In other words, they uh, reproduce through spores. Now this reconstruction of Red Hill was one that uh, Ted Deschler and I consulted on when, with the, um, the art department at uh, National Geographic magazine. And I don't know if you've seen this issue, it came out in May, 1999, and Ted had just recently gotten his PhD and I was still 
um, well, when we did the consultation, it took a few years for them to finally publish it. I was still in graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania where Ted had just finished, but he had had um, already had quite a long, maybe a decade or so professional career as a paleontologist with a master's degree. And it was hired by the Academy of Natural Sciences as one of their curators. Um, so this is a pretty spectacular reproduction. And of course it foregrounds the vertebrates and it has just about every organism that was uh, had been discovered at that point at Red Hill, including um, shows a couple of tetrapods, one of them ducking out under it's the top predator in the ecosystem, a um, lobe fin fish called Hyneria. And there's a couple of arthrodire placoderms here. Okay. And uh, in, in the background, I had done my investigations as a doctoral student far enough to at least know what the major species were of plants that were found at the, um, at the site. And I was, this, this, um, this was a little premature, this reconstruction, but it is, represents a hypothesis that I was testing that the plants in the landscape of the late Devonian were dividing up the ecological niches amongst themselves by um, high order um, taxonomic Great. In other words, totally different kinds of plants were in different parts of the, the environment. And it, you, you see this the very uh, patchy look here with these kind of monotypic stands of different uh, types of plants. And I'll get into more about what they are, but they're essentially the progymnosperm trees, um, some ferns, some like lycopsids. Like and these are an unbranching variety over here. And then um, early seed plants. And this was the period of the earliest seed plants. And at the time, they were small herbaceous things. So just to remind folks or let people know for the first time, if um, you didn't hear Ted or aren't familiar with the research, but uh, Red Hill is a road cut in Clinton County in North Central Pennsylvania. And it's um, along a state highway, State Highway 120, and along the west branch of the Susquehanna River, which isn't shown in the map, but uh, goes parallel with uh, State Route 120 here. And it's a road cut along 120. And um, you can just drive by there and see a succession of layers there. But to the casual observer, you wouldn't um, necessarily know that it was a hotbed of uh, the late Devonian, um, the Catskill Formation. In this, in this scene right here, you see um, Heiner View, the little village of Heiner is down this way, and North Bend is to the rear of us, but that's Heiner View, which is a state park in Pennsylvania with a really beautiful overlook looking down into the West Branch Susquehanna Valley. And it's where you see occasional hang gliders coming off, cruising around amongst the, uh, the ravens that were also very common up and down the valley. And this is the direction looking towards North Bend. And okay, sorry about that. I'm trying to admit, there's multiple ways of advancing the slides and I've got to stick to just one and keep my finger off the mouse pad whenever I'm not uh, using the arrows. Okay, so this, you get another view of the layers here and uh, Red Hill has become quite the fossil pilgrimage site. I do um, recommend if you're in the area, it's kind of out of the way, but uh, to come and check it out. And this is it's a couple decades ago now of a group from Penn State, I believe, just showing them around pointing out the layers, which in this photo mosaic, you can see um, perhaps the multiple layers of uh, siltstone, sandstone, and um, areas that are 
siltstone that are a little farther eroded out is little benches and those are paleosols. And very faintly, you can see that over here, most of it's red. So um, it's one of many red hills around. In uh, my, my father and his siblings grew up with the red hill, which was also in the same late Devonian formation, the Catskill formation, but there are also red hills that are in Triassic red beds in Pennsylvania. But this is the one in Clinton County. And you can see it's got these highly oxidized sediments, but here you have uh, reduced um, iron in this right layer right there, which um, was, um, deposited in slightly different redox conditions. And uh, that's where most of the plant fossils came from. And um, a few of the vertebrate fossils, but many of the vertebrate fossils came from uh, other, other layers that uh, represented mainly floodplain deposits. So what is that uh, reduced layer? And here's a diagram made based on that, um, that uh, previous picture that uh, shows a little more clearly that there is kind of a, a lens shape convex down um, profile to it. And it was end to end with this um, wedge shape here and uh, leading to the interpretation. We thought this is a beautiful cross cut of the sh a shoreline of a pond where there was standing water with reducing conditions that was, there we go. Yeah, I see what I'm doing here. That um, I just have to not put so much pressure on. Um, reducing conditions that was conducive to uh, plant preservation and then overlying uh, floodplain sediment from uh, later flooding from the main channel, um, which was much more conducive to a lot of uh, bone preservation. But this right here, we thought was a point bar of a meander, but uh, this is clearly, the channels were clearly much bigger than, the, than this. So we went back and forth with various interpretations, but it's, it's a floodplain pond. I'm sorry about that. Okay. And here's a stratigraphic column that kind of shows uh, the sequence. And then there, there's some, some sandstones come in. Um, whenever there's uh, you know, higher velocity flooding and uh, dropping out of, of the sand um, in this very dynamic uh, river floodplain environment. And this is a very simplistic diagram. This is one that was made by Dennis Murphy. His website is still um, available. Um, it's called Devonian Times. You can Google it and it has a lot of information about Red Hill, and on the left is a very simplistic um, depiction of what an oxbow lake, you know, you, you guys are out there close to the Mississippi, so you know all about that. And uh, it, kind of an interpretation of, of where the vegetation was um, with respect to a main channel, but it's much more complicated than that. And as we were working with um, Rudy Slingerland, a sedimentologist at, at Penn State, when he came along and uh, just was one of those visitors at Red Hill, he was looking at the uh, the sandstone wedges with us and the, their relationship with the, the larger um, sandstone bodies that were farther down. It's a kilometer long um, road cut, actually. And the part where we can have access into the, the benched area, like the one behind me in, in my little screen here. Um, <laughs> um, uh, it, it's, it's just a, it's a very large, very large uh, site. And um, look, but looking at the whole thing, only part of it's accessible in terms of its fossils where we can climb up. And some of it's just sheer sandstones, which represented the, 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 the movement of the main channel. But a lot of the sandstone and siltstone that we see um, with the, the wedge shape 
sand bodies or the, the convex lensed sand bodies that are convex upwards uh, come from this um, dynamism in the in the uh, in the river where um, their evulsions would take place and Rudy had uh, studied this in the Saskatchewan River in Canada which has never in its history been I'll use the word tamed but uh, no dams or any other um, changes by human beings. So he was able to see what the natural um, dynamics of a, of a river are and study those in, in great detail. And it created a very good model for us to understand what was going on in the late Devonian, which was a time when uh, meandering streams really were coming into their own because prior to that, um, those streams were braided because in order to have the, the meandering dynamic, you have to have vegetation to um, slow things down. Um, but um, these, these levees along the channels would uh, routinely um, break and uh, flood the surrounding floodplain. And um, you'd get water ponded up against uh, outer levees and uh, numerous ponds and and so on in uh, in the floodplain, as you can see from this picture here, which is the Saskatchewan River. So where were these meandering streams? Well, geologically speaking, they were in the um, Catskill Delta, and which extends from New York, where the mountains known as the Catskills are. It was time transgressive, so the, the actual Catskill Mountains None of which, none of the rocks of which are there are called the Catskill Formation um, are Middle Devonian. And then with the uh, colliding of the continents and the, the creation of the Acadian Mountains and their erosion to form the Catskill Delta, um, it was roughly a, a northeast to southwest time transgression of the, the collision and the deposition of the sediments out into the uh, shallow mid continental sea which uh, are in the, the left block diagram, mostly Western Pennsylvania and Ohio. There's the, the famous Cleveland Shale, which is contemporaneous with, uh, with the Catskill Formation, had the giant Dunkley osteus, um, Arthur Dyer placoderms as big as a school bus and the, uh, the, the famous sharks and so on. And then some, somewhere farther out there was um, Illinois, and um, I think it was underwater at that time too. <laughs> but the Acadian Mountains uh, occurred from a collision between um, Eastern North America, which was already joined with uh, Europe, parts of Europe, and uh, and a a, uh, a a small continental fragment that uh, geologists have named Acadia. And this kind of shows a little diagram of where Catskill Delta and Red Hill are located with the uh, outlines of the um, couple of the contemporary continents. Yeah, and then Gondwana land would be down to the lower right corner um, approaching when they come together for the final of Appalachian orogeny, the Allegheny orogeny, and the forming of Pangaea. So what uh, can we infer from looking closely at the sediments, uh, particularly the uh, paleosol sediments? Um, they have these things, structures called pedogenic slickensides. So slickensides is also the uh, word for, comes from the German, for the uh, the polished surfaces between two sides of a fault in an earthquake, but in miniature form, you get that in certain kinds of soils and it's preserved in the fossil soils where there's shrinking and swelling of the, uh, of the uh, sediment of the, of the soil due to um, it's getting soaked and then drying and then getting soaked again. And um, whenever the, the soil cracks, 
um, material falls into the cracks and then when the rains come again, it, it swells and it creates these a little uh, um, slick and sided surfaces from the movements of different parts of the soil past each other. And uh, that allows us to infer some uh, climate reconstruction for this, um, this area and back in the late Devonian and that was, it was monsoonal. So it was seasonal wet and dry. And so that helps us with the picture of um, that this flooding that took place was also seasonal. And also the dryness lent itself to um, fires, perhaps induced during the onset of the, uh, the wet season and uh, thunderstorms and lighting up the vegetation and burning it. And at the time, when I found these little black specks in there, it looked suspiciously like charcoal, which it turned out to be, it was the um, oldest known charcoal that had been found in the fossil record. And um, that's because there was no Snoky, Smoky Bear. In fact, Smoky Bear's um, common ancestor with us was the, the tetrapods that were in this environment. So in an, closely examining the charcoal, as you can see in this uh, SEM micrograph on the lower right, which I did at the uh, University of Pennsylvania's dental school, um, you can see these um, tube-like structures, which are the, uh, the conducting uh, structures for the water to go through a plant. And because um, these particular structures have been found in silicified um, fossils of Rachophyton serotangium, which was a widespread late Devonian fern, and fern in quotes, just it was it was a homosporous plant that was uh, herbaceous. Um, that, that that was primarily what was burning because uh, look, examining piece of charcoal after piece of charcoal, it um, was apparent that that uh, was um, mainly Rachophyton that had been burned, and it's amazing you think about it that uh, the process of burning but in the absence of um, oxygen, which kind of sounds uh, paradoxical, but um, the, the, uh, the heat has fused the cell walls and preserved it for the last 365 million years. Of course, the outer layers were burned to ash, um, but uh, you can get amazing preservation through the process of burning. And, um, there, it, uh, it kind of paints a picture of um, these Rachophyton shallowly rooted, probably in the dry season, got um, pretty dry and would just light up if um, hit by a spark. So also in the landscape, I had mentioned the Archaeopteris trees. Sounds a lot like the word Archaeopteryx, which of course was the uh, earliest um, feathered dinosaur that was discovered in Bavaria back in the 1860s. But uh, as, as a similar derivation, this means uh, ancient, ancient fern frond and Archaeopteryx means ancient wing. And I suppose a, a fern frond and a wing kind of look similar. So I think they're etymologically related. And there are a couple different species of uh, Archaeopteryx based on um, their, their leaf shape. And you see a couple of here, these are some nice specimens that were found at Red Hill, Archaeopteris hibernica and Archaeopteris massalenta. And uh, of course the species concept was, was uh, a lot of, lot of inferences there. They might've just been different uh, morphotypes, but um, I had mentioned that these were tall trees. Um, Maybe getting up to as much as 100 meters tall. And uh, they had bifacial cambium, modern wood, but they reproduced through spores. Also in the landscape were these lycopsids. Um, you're very familiar with those. So these would have been predecessors of the enormous ones that are fossilized out there in the Illinois basin. 
fragments, which could be found in Mazin Creek. And uh, of course, um, Pennsylvania has the uh, Pennsylvanian beds, as, as do you out there in the Carboniferous, where those uh, large uh, lycopsids found, Lepidodendrons, Sigillaria, and so on. But um, it was in the late Devonian when they were starting to get large. Um, they have a number of different uh, types at uh, Red Hill, including something that looks like Lepidodendropsis. But then there was also one that uh, seemed to have no, it turned out to have no uh, um, similarities to any that had previously been discovered. So I had the opportunity to name the species. And um, what is interesting about it is that the, uh, the, the rootlets, there's a couple of slides here in the lower right and the upper left, specimens of Atanoxonia beer baueri, um, that show the, the rootlets in a lobed base, which is uh, of the isoatalian condition. They're these uh, modern quillworts, which are these tiny plants compared to their, their ancestors, um, some of which are found in, uh, along the shores of the West Branch of Susquehanna, and we took some home and, or back to the lab as, as mascots. But um, Lycopsids are very interesting because they represent an entirely separate lineage from all other land plants. And they do things at a very fundamental level, very differently from the other plants. And I'm lumping all the other plants together, the, um, the ferns, the horsetails, which are essentially weird ferns, um, the seed plants, the progymnosperms, um, all of them are one category with a common ancestor and lycopsids diverged very early on with a separate lineage. And one of the things that distinguish them from the other plants is that what look like roots are actually modified leaves that anchor them into the ground. And um, one indication of that is that they, they, um, they the attachments are in a whorl, which is the way leaves grow. So, and, and when you look at their embryos, which you can see in, um, I believe you, they've been found out there in Illinois, um, you can see that the embryologically, it's, it's essentially, they're, they're bipolar. And um, this Autonoxonia, as far as we can determine, we're, a branching variety, and here's kind of a reconstruction here, and it would have been um, photosynthetic along its entire stem. Now, a little bit about the name, Atsnoxonia Bierbaueri. We decided to name it after Dick Bierbauer, who is in the middle of this picture in the front, looking like he's presiding over the whole event there. This was a field trip in 1995, my first time at, um, Red Hill, it was a Society for Vertebrate Paleontology field trip led by Ted Deschler. Here is the, the young Ted Deschler. Here's the young me and, uh, and Dick Bierbauer, who I think always, it looked like that. And uh, Ted and I, because Dick Bierbauer, um, he published the first textbook that actually treated fossil fossils as the remnants of flora and fauna that existed in an ecosystem. And so we, were, we had this opportunity to reconstruct this ecosystem here. And, and um, he was like our, our guru, or as Ted said, he's our Obi-Wan Kenobi. And uh, so <laughs> when it came time to naming this um, plant that was essentially a living lightsaber because in proportions and uh, size, it was well like that. Um, name it uh, O. Bierbaueri, which kind of has a, you know, Obi-Wan kind of ring to it. And the Oxenoxonia part is the, the Seneca name, based on the Seneca name for the, the, the Oxenoxen, which was the, 
the West Branch of the Susquehanna. So a couple of other um, notable people here. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about an organism that Keith Thompson, paleontologist Keith Thompson, who was for a while the, um, the president of the Academy of Natural Sciences, he named it after, lovingly named it after his wife, Linda. Um, some local personalities. If you ever go to Red Hill, uh, make sure that you let Doug know. And if he, you don't let him know and you show up there, he'll know soon enough and show up. And um, an organism was named after him. An organism was named after Norm Delaney, who was the local town of Renovo's um, jeweler and had an eye for very tiny things, which came in handy. And then this is Del Zatsmari, a retired cop. And he also made a discovery which was named after him. And I will show all of those to you. And just this is Michael Coates, who is um, a pretty renowned uh, fish paleontologist from Great Britain. And he was very entertaining. And he saw us a road sign that we take for granted. And he said, yield. Yield, that's a bit archaic, isn't it? And he said, uh, yield, scurvy knave? And I said, well, what do your signs say? And he said, make way. So we in the United States have kind of an archaic form of uh, English, apparently. So the plants, uh, the, the seed plants or spermatophytes, um, the ones at Red Hill are contemporaneous with the other known oldest seed plants like Alkinzia from West Virginia, which has uh, been described in great detail in the literature. And these, these seeds or ovules, don't know if they were fertilized. Um, so we'll just be safe and call them ovules. There's a variety of them there or um, different uh, cupule structures, which these early, these early seeds had um, these structures that surrounded them, many of them, um, or they had vestiges of them, um, which was part of the paper about Pseudosporognites quadripartitis, which is a very ugly name. But um, the one at Red Hill was uh, prompted a, a amalgamation of the number of specimens from both Belgium and um, and the UK. Uh, th three of us co-wrote this paper. It was led by the Belgian author, um, Cyril Presciani, kind of a Belgian-Italian name, um, where he saw the similarities amongst the specimens in Red Hill in Belgium and the UK and gave them all one name. And um, it's not too terribly surprising that the flora here at Red Hill is very similar to the flora in Belgium and the UK because it was just, just across the mountains at that point. So these cupule structures, there have been some biomechanical um, experiments done that, um, to test the hypothesis as to whether there were likely structures that allowed for, um, or it's made it conducive to the pollination. So another one, um, was found there was this cupule structure that was unique and so resulted in a publication in the naming of uh, another unique red hill organism duodimidia for the double structure uh, cupule structure and named after yet another person my thesis advisor pfeffer corny or herman herman pfeffercorn and i actually couldn't resist naming a seed structure, even though it's not round, um, after a man named Pfeffercorn. So some other um, plants at uh, Red Hill, everything from the very simple looking and wispy Gillespie randolphensis to the very elaborate looking Brunophyton obscurum. Brunophyton is uh, a, a zostrophil, which is one of the like Cops, its closest relatives it's in that lineage. And um, Gillespie is another uh, 
extinct, extinct fern from the Staropterid lineage, and fern again used loosely as a homosporous uh, herb. And then there's <laughs> this. Does anybody know what this is? I um, I put this in there. I had put this in for. Uh, paleobotanical audiences to say, I think this is progarinophyton. It looks like a zostrophil. It's got some sphenopterous leaves there, which is probably from uh, one of the seed plants, but never found the actual uh, ovule structures attached to any of that foliage. But um, looks like another of those interesting cone-like uh, zostrophil images. So, that was a kind of a cast of plant characters, but um, my dissertation project and many of my publications has to do with interpreting where they were in the landscape. So how did I go about doing that? Well, we had that really nice profile of um, the pond and one edge of it. And uh, that went for about uh, 70 meters that um, gray plant layer. And I, what I did was I made um, a regular series of excavations in it and went down through the, about the meter thickness of it, a centimeter at a time, and did little quadrat counts with uh, that little framed uh, object there in the, in the photo that had uh, a centimeter wide spacing of strings um, to make little centimeter squares. And my hammer, my chisel, uh, my hard hat, and uh, a whisk broom to clear each layer as I went down. And I tabulated within the uh, little quadrat measurer um, the number and variety of plant fragments that I could identify. There were a lot of unknowns, um, but um, did a count down through the layer and out from the edge of the pond to wherever it was going um, in the, not maybe not the middle of the pond, it might've been totally along the edge, I don't know, but uh, it seemed to uh, show what was, falling in at the edge and what was floating farther out. And I also looked at the, its state of uh, um, disassembly or its uh, decay. There were lots of things that uh, were very well preserved and were in plants in their entirety. And uh, so they weren't coming from very far. Some were fragments like of Archaeopteris, um, pieces of it coming from farther away. So. Uh, there I was pounding away from May to September every weekend. I would drive up five hours up and five hours back and um, went through every hatch of biting insect that the river had to offer and um, listened to the ravens going up and down the valley and heard a little uh, bunch of coyote pups yelping probably when their mother brought them something to eat. It was, it was just uh, just me and the wilderness of the late Devonian and of the contemporary West Branch Susquehanna Valley and um, cars going up and down occasionally and people saying, what are you looking for fossils? And uh, the answer is yes. So seem to have um, found support for the hypothesis that the plants were um, partitioning the landscape at a high taxonomic level. Um, so the, the Archaeopteris seemed like they were, were sending fragments into the pond from uh, plants that were growing up on the levee. The Rachophyton seemed to be growing on the nearby floodplain up to perhaps the edge of the, uh, the pond. Of course, it could have been growing and shrinking. The uh, lycopsids are swamp plants and they are fine with their feet being wet or in the water. There's a couple different varieties, but um, most interestingly, I think was 
that in looking at the counts along the um, the profile, and I also counted the charcoal once I discovered that that's what uh, was in there. And the most telling thing was that the seed plants, the spermatophyte remains were above all of the rachophyton remains and the rachophyton seemed to uh, disappear whenever the, the fires, um, after the, the sequence of charcoal or a fire as indicated by the charcoal. So, so from that, I posited that the, the rachophyton would burn and the seed plants would come in and replace them. So uh, seed plants were essentially weeds that grew on disturbed areas as weeds do by the roadside nowadays until they evolved different, different lineages and were occupying different niches. But in their early, in their early appearance, they were you know, opt opportunistic herbs. So, okay. Um, I show the tantalizing glimpse here. Here's where I get into a little bit of a personal story. So while I was reconstructing the one of the earliest primordial forests in what's now Pennsylvania, I was um, talking to my family members and doing a little investigation. I got a greater and greater appreciation for my um, more recent human ancestors, not just my late Devonian tetrapod ancestors, a uh, role in the surrounding landscape. And uh, turns out that uh, just a couple miles from Red Hill was uh, numerous lumber camps, including one that was run by one of my great, great grandfathers. And I've shown this picture to different audiences and I don't know you folks at um, Northern Illinois, but when I showed it to a city group, um, the Paleontological Society in Philadelphia, I got a lot of funny uh, remarks about banjos and stuff, but when I showed it to the folks in central Pennsylvania at the Harrisburg Area Paleontological Society, there were some appreciative <laughs> nods of the head, but anyway, so here's my, here's my great, great grandfather. Um, a couple decades after he rode with uh, Sherman to the sea in Georgia, um, I haven't shown this to a Southern audience. And on his lap is uh, my mother's great aunt Pearl. And uh, someone in the family wrote uh, Grandpa Karstetter here. And he was uh, the father of um, Josephine or father-in-law of Josephine Karstetter. And Josephine is still a family name. I have a daughter named Josephine. My grandmother's name was Josephine, but uh, Josephine was a, uh, she was a camp orphan who uh, was adopted and came into the family there. But um, just, oh, and what they were doing as I was, see, I was investigating the oldest known primordial forest in Pennsylvania and they were cutting down the most recent primordial forest in Pennsylvania and rendering it into the railroad ties and, and uh, building lumber for the, the growing nation until the uh, that was all wiped out. And then I like, guess was the Midwestern like Michigan forests were next. So let's see, what's my next slide? So that was just an interesting little personal note I'll throw in there. And oh, and here's, here's the picture of the the lumber camp and you can see the denuded trees there, but uh, you know that there might have, might have been some good fossil exposures up there that are now grown over, half, happily grown over. Um, and remember little aunt, uh, great aunt Pearl? Well, here's what she grew up to be like. She was a railroad signal operator and, and quite a, a unique woman. I wish I had known her. My mother uh, really enjoyed when she came to visit because she said there was a lot of cussing. And she had a female companion named Bill, who in the census record was uh, recorded as her um, border, but uh, we know better because Bill always came and was part of the family and also cussed a lot. 
So other, the cast of other crusty characters um, from North Central Pennsylvania. <laughs> Here's uh, some uh, terrestrial invertebrates that um, were discovered at the Red Hill, including a millipede on the right, which I don't have a scale bar there, but it's um, pretty small compared to the ones from the Pennsylvanian period, which got really huge because of the high oxygen levels. And on the left is a trigonotarbid arachnid. It's a, yes, it's a eight-legged spider relative, but um, early, it's got a lot more segments. So it's more basal form. And this is the one named after Del Zatsmari. It's a gigantic Carinus Zatsmarii. He's the one that, that found it. And um, amongst the vertebrates, lots of fish, great diversity of fish. Now, um, this is a little dated. The fish I'm gonna show you are the ones known up until about 10 years ago. And I know that there's more fish and tetrapods have been discovered there. So this is, I'm, I'm giving you a, this is my old, old talk that I've revived. And um, last time I gave it was a few years ago and then it was an old talk. And I told the group, well, you know, it's an old talk. I don't have much new information because I've moved on to other things in my research, my scholarly endeavors. And they said, well, it's new to us. So I hope, uh, I hope you're finding new, out new stuff here. A couple of sh um, shark species, including these spiny sharks, the Tinacanthus and uh, little tiny Agiliotus teeth. Um, Acanthodian fish, which were some of the earliest jawed vertebrates, and uh, they lasted up until, um, I think they might have went extinct at the end of the Devonian, but they're, uh, these, they're, they're pretty impressive spines are um, very commonly found at Red Hill. And a number of different arthrodire placoderms. Um, including species that I don't have here that was discovered at Red Hill, but you see that they've got this armor and they've got these, uh, these fins with uh, spikes. And you find very commonly these uh, Arthur Dyer plates in the red beds at Red Hill. And then this is the, what the jeweler found, um, Norm Delaney. Limnomus delanii, or the freshwater fish, or Delaney's freshwater fish. This is um, a um, early bony fish. You know, they have these heterocircle or asymmetric tails, like uh, gars and and uh, bow fins and so on. Um, this, the teleost fish evolved more symmetric tails. Later, the this, the uh, the vertebrae go up into the tail, the upper portion, upper lobe of the tail. But uh, at first, people have been seeing these tiny little specks, and um, or actually, Norm had seen these tiny little specks, and he thought, well, they, they have a structure to them. What are these? And it turns out it was the scales, and then folks started to find the um, whole fish, like the one depicted in the bottom picture, and especially in the um, in in amongst the uh, the plant fossils in the the uh, the greenish gray bed. So they were probably hiding in amongst the, uh, the sunken vegetation. And that was their defense. You, you saw these other fish species that have spines and armor and so on. These little guys hid, but what were the, the others defending themselves from? Well, tetrapods probably ate these, but um, there was these huge low fin fish. And um, there's a couple of different lineages. One, one lineage of which led to tetrapods, which evolved uh, digits, which initially were used for propelling themselves in the shallows of, of, the, of the water. There was an aquatic adaptation, which was then used to, to wallow out onto the land. But um, here's Hyneria, named after the little village of Heiner. Um, and its genus name, and then a species name, it's named after Linda. Keith Thompson's wife, and she was flattered by that, but to be named after something with uh, such 
huge fangs like like these here. This is this is a little picture here or a couple pictures of um, Hyneria fossils. This is a tail, lobe tail, and here's here's that early reconstruction. Um, and now you've seen all the different casts of characters that are in that reconstruction there. Uh, this is at the Red Hill Field Museum in the Chapman Township uh, building, it occupies the upper floor near the, the town commissioners meet, but um, Doug Rowe is, presides over the uh, museum there. He's collected a lot of um, specimens that, not, none of the type specimens or anything like that, they're all at the Academy of Natural Sciences, but it's a nice little museum if you're ever there and, and Doug will open it up for you. And of course, there are tetrapods there, and I just this is just a picture showing um, the front left limbs of a variety of lobefin fish and lobefin fish descendants, um, various tetrapods going up, I think, into the Carboniferous period. So you can see that uh, that we're descended from. We are lobefin fish. There's, a, there's another t-shirt. You saw the out of the use and born to cruise uh, t-shirt designed by Ray Troll, who's Ted and my favorite artist. He has another one. It's um, basically, you know, we are all lobe fin fish. And um, this, th th this was the number of uh, tetrapod fossils that have been found as of the time I made this. <laughs> Since this is not a vertebrate talk, I haven't been keeping, keeping up with this, but um, Hynerpeton, Bassidae, and was the first one. This is uh, the shoulder girdle, and then a jaw of of uh, something called Designathus, or thick jaw roe, named after Doug Rowe, who found it. And uh, he's been honored numerous times because he's really he's really was what um, made Red Hill a viable fossil site by just being there and uh, keeping an eye on it and keeping. The, maintaining the Red Hill Museum, been great. And um, that's where pieces in a reconstruction are. And my, my question was, well, how do we know that those were tetrapods if we haven't found the actual feet which define a tetrapod, but there are characteristics of the jaw and, and the shoulder girdle that uh, are homologous with tetrapods who are known from their entire skeletons. And these are the two classic and earliest known ones from East Greenland, Ichthystega and Acanthostega. So, um, where are we? We are crawling out of the land and <laughs> um, just, it seems as though once we have characterized the landscape that uh, it, this was the um, evolutionary framework of our ancestry at that stage and the ancestry of all um, four-legged creatures or secondarily um, non-four-legged creatures like snakes and aquatic creatures that have returned like um, whales and dolphins and, and so on. But uh, this is kind of a nice little profile also created by Dennis Murphy. Check out his website, Devonian Times. Yeah, the, the main channel where there are lots of dangers and you can be protected by um, hiding in the down foli foliage, which you don't see here or have armor or spikes, or you could elude the danger by whenever there's seasonal flooding and the different parts of the floodplain are joined, or, or you could um, use your adaptations of your fins into limbs to crawl along the moist ground to safe refuge where you could uh, um, reproduce and so on and um, be a tetrapod. So are we close to the end here? Uh, yes, but one little addendum. This is the one change to the talk that I've made and that is a new reconstruction was made um, fairly recently. And uh, in 2014, the um, National Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC 
had closed its fossil hulls for a tire overhaul. And um, I was consulted on a new reconstruction of Red Hill to go in their portion here. And uh, this was a reconstruction by an artist named Julius Satoni. And I probably mispronounced his name, but it actually gives uh, kind of precedence to the plants and it turned out to be a lot smaller than I thought it would be. But um, they are, I think they've probably finished dioramas at this point, whenever they had the uh, grand opening gala before it opened to the public, um, they hadn't finished the dioramas. And I think there's some big Red Hill dioramas farther down the hallway now, which were pretty cool. I've seen some pictures of them in construction, but here, um, one of the things that uh, hadn't been known when that National Geographic reconstruction does, do, was done was um, the fires. And the, you can't really tell very well, but this is a, a burnt par portion of the, of the uh, floodplain. And you've got your Archaeopteris and you've got your Otsnoxonia and other Lycopsids and you've got your Rachophyton and, oh, and there's some seed plants over there and so on. So it's, uh, it's quite a thrill to have uh, the results of my scientific work depicted, albeit anonymously, like uh, you know, as everybody else's was there, except for the people that actually work at the Smithsonian who were featured, um, as just make that contribution to the greatest story ever told, the one about the history of life on earth in uh, one of the, the most visited museums and one of the most visited museum exhibits in the world. So that was pretty cool. So that's the end. I will stop sharing. And I put you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, I enjoyed that. That was that was very interesting. Oh, good. I really like the picture of the charcoal and the the fine detail in that. Oh yeah, yeah. You mean the the uh, the photomicrograph? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? And that it survived all those years. I mean, that mm -hmm. that's just incredible. Well, to think that uh, something being burned is a form of preservation, mm -hmm. given the right circumstances anyway. Of course, a lot of it was turned to ash, but then the part in the middle. Yeah. 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 So, so uh, questions for the in-person audience. Happy to answer any questions or attempt to. Those copules. I was really hoping for a more interesting story about the beer bowery name, but you know. I, oh, you're I, not a Star Wars fan? I'm, I'm not. A, no, no, no. I like that part. No, I was thinking some drunken night you found it, and there's, you know, it was a really juicy story, but I love the Obi Wan, you know, <laughs> reference. I don't think Dick Beerbauer ever got it. Oh, in the, in the description, I said it's named after Richard. Dick Bierbauer for the, the force of his ideas, but I did not capitalize force. <laughs> gotta, That's clever, clever. Gotta, gotta keep your nerdiness a little. Yeah, soft, no, soft. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any questions from the, the live audience? Those cupules that you showed, um, those are really small, right? Yeah, yeah, I guess the this scale bar, I don't know if, <laughs> I had them there, but yeah, they're just about as, they vary in size, but um, they're about a centimeter or so. So we find a lot of uh, teridosperms here, of course, as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we find the seeds and we find the synangiate pollen organs, but uh, cupules with ovules, of course, you know, we're, we're never really sure when we find something that looks like a seed, is this an ovule or is this a seed? But Mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, I'm sure we're finding seeds, but uh, you know, as far as finding just a cupule or or something really small, that that's really difficult. Yeah, it, it seemed like um, this whole cupule morphology disappeared by the time of the uh, 
Pennsylvanian period. It just seems like that was something that was characteristic of these earlier seed plants, and they took a variety of different forms. And um, what Cyril Prestiani was arguing for was that this pseudosporogenonitis had a cupule, although it was so, so small. Because Bef before that, people were making a distinction amongst the cupulate and the acupulate spermatophytes from the late Devonian. And um, not everybody believed that. Gar Rothwell, who worked extensively with Elkinzia, I think he was skeptical about, about that. Skeptical that Elkinzia was cupulate? Oh, no, 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 no. Skeptical that these were, um, that, that, I think he was skeptical that there were tiny little cupules on these. The ones who had formerly been considered uh, acupulate, but I, I didn't get too deep into it. I was a co-author, but uh, Cyril took the lead on that. I said, okay, you, help, you helped me with uh, that technique that was perfected by Belgian paleobotanists of taking a steel probe and removing the uh, sandstone or siltstone matrix one grain at a time from around these delicate cupule structures and ovules. And uh, <laughs> I had sent the specimens over to him to do that. I said, yeah, you can, you can run with it. <laughs> Question about oxygen. You had made this comment that uh, the charcoal was formed uh, during the burning, but with low levels of oxygen versus high levels elsewhere at different times. Uh, how well backed up is this sort of thing? I always had the impression that there was a lot of oxygen during well, the period. Okay, so I, I need to make this distinction. I think I was being a little confusing because when I was talking about the preservation of the cellular structure of the plant was under low oxygen conditions, but that wasn't the atmospheric oxygen. That just happened to be because it was um, enclosed or something enclosed. Like that. It was enclosed by the surrounding tissues and the surrounding tissues turned to ash. Um, but the, the first person to take a real interest in that first paper I published about discovering the charcoal was an atmospheric uh, geologist named Tim Lenton from the UK who was uh, investigating the um, oxygen levels of the earth through time. And this was the early indication that the atmospheric oxygen levels had reached a point where there could be um, combustion, which I think was 13% from experiments, um, currently at 20%. But um, there's been subsequent papers written about uh, the, the oxygen gap. So charcoal had continued to be found older and older down into the lower Devonian, but in the middle Devonian, there there's, seems to be a charcoal gap in places where one would likely see it. And so people have argued that that was a fluctuation of atmospheric oxygen during that time, which of course got got higher and higher as there are more and more plants. And I think in the, the Earth's history, the uh, level of atmospheric oxygen was the highest in the Carboniferous period. And that's when you've got those huge insects and other arthropods like the gigantic millipede relatives and the meganura um, dragonflies as big as seagulls because insects, um, breathe oxygen by um, diffusion. And uh, you can only have something that big. Uh, Mothra, with notwithstanding, you know, the giant moth from Godzilla movies. Um, yeah, yeah, Mothra <laughs> appeared to the Cretaceous. Yeah, no, right, like, like uh, Godzilla, right? Um, yeah, that was when the I don't I don't know what the percentage was, but it was it was really high, and that's what enabled there to be gigantic arthropods. Charcoal is found in a lot of carbon beds, coal beds. Mm -hmm. uh, 
they may be classified as quote fusionite. But, exactly. Uh, it's all over the place at all kinds of times. Well, those coal swamps were burning a lot be because of the high oxygen levels. Probably yeah. didn't take, take much to spark them. Um, one of the early tetrapods uh, Tiktaalik discovered up in the Arctic, would it have lived in a similar environment as Red Hill? It was, it was a similar environment. They found that in uh, that Ted and uh, Neil Shubin and, and folks um, found that in sedimentary deposits up there. It, or as, um, as that was generally speaking, fluvial deposits, so river sediments. Yeah, that, that seems to be where that um, evolution was taking place. You mentioned that uh, with the lumber camp, there might have been other exposures up in the uh, in the hills. Do you know of other exposures besides Red Hill that you've explored? Oh yeah, yeah. We we explored lots of other exposures in north central Pennsylvania, um, and yeah, that was kind of a, a a sick joke because you know out west where there are hardly any trees, you can have lots of exposures, and uh, where the hillsides are denuded, I thought oh, it's probably exposed a lot of um, rock up there. Um, but uh, yeah, if there's um, Route 15 that goes down, it's to the east of Red Hill. It's a north-south um, route that has lots of road cuts. And during this period of time when we were doing these investigations, there were some new road building. And um, there's numerous things found there. Interestingly, along Route uh, 15, there are some sites that have a totally different fish fauna. Um, Holoptychius, which is a yet a representative of yet another lineage of lobefin fish, the poroliforms, and there's um, uh, Bothriolipus, which is um, you know, it's a, another placoderm group different from the arthrodires, uh, antiar, I'm not quite getting the, the word right, but um, the interpretation has been it was more of an estuarine um, group of, of, of uh, you know, closer to the salt water, brackish water group of uh, organisms. Also lungfish are found along there at a different site. Um, so there, there's some other sites besides Red Hill, but nothing that even comes close to the diversity, not just of different fish, including the tetrapods, but uh, with the plants as well. And usually the plants are found in different fossil sites from the animals. And then, and then the, uh, the uh, arthropods as well, the terrestrial arthropods. Oh, and since then, uh, scorpions have been found at Red Hill too. Paul, I have a question pertaining to Red Hill itself today. Yes. Uh, last I heard, it was taken over and managed now by U.S. Forestry. Is that the truth? And do we still actually have access to Red Hill along that road cut? Oh, wow. I have not been there for a few years, and I've been out of touch with Doug. I've been out of touch even with Ted. So I really don't know. Okay. Yeah. you. Um, you're, you've caught me at a kind of a retrospective time when I'm looking back at work that I've done in a different decade. Okay. Thank you. So I, I can't I can't give you the the latest. Catherine, you're going to ask something. No, no. No. Oh, okay. I was just agreeing and listening. Yep. Yeah. So you think these plants of the Fornian produce more oxygen, right? Uh, you ask about plants producing oxygen? Yes. Yeah, the more the plants, plants. Yeah, it seems that, well, um, plant, land plants produce about 50%, this is today, of um, the Earth's oxygen and plankton, photosynthetic organisms in the sea, those little teeny things that float around, um, produce another 50%. 
Yeah, but what about in the Devonian? Oh, there there was plankton in the D Devonian too, and but there was in, it seemed to be the oxygen went up and down, but it seemed towards the end as the plants got bigger and more widespread, there was more and more oxygen in the atmosphere. A little bit of a different eyeball question. The tetrapods, you were showing the, the bone structure, the hands, so to oh, speak. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of tetrapods essentially have five fingers. Uh, you had all kinds with multiple fingers and mm -hmm. a few fingers. Is anybody really tied that together? Yeah, well, there have been people looking at that and looking at um, the, the embryology of contemporary organisms, particularly salamanders and the uh, development of the digits and the person who has been doing a lot of that is Neil Shubin, who was at the University of Pennsylvania, but is now at the University of Chicago. And he's kind of unique in combining um, paleontolo paleontological evidence along with uh, evolutionary developmental evidence with uh, laboratory experimentation in analogous systems. Um, but these early tetrapods, it, it seemed to take a few million years to seemingly settle. I mean, that's a weird way of saying it, uh, but on five, five digits, because um, I think Acanthostega had eight or something like that. Ichthyostega had another number more than five. And yeah, so that, that's kind of interesting. It's, um, and the, the developmental pathways and the, the homologs amongst the genes between ray fin fish and these lobe fin fish, including limbed um, vertebrates, I think has been delineated in some detail. Okay. Which I don't have up, up here but I'm, I'm aware that uh, Neil particularly has been working on that and other people. I think whenever you talk about evolution and people like to pull out, oh, everybody's a fish or a part of one. <laughs> uh, and yeah, five fingers because fish developed five fingers and all that sort of stuff. You get into some interesting arguments. <laughs> <laughs> and it's worth avoiding. <laughs> yeah, I guess it dep depends. Depends on who's at your Thanksgiving table, I guess. Right. Oh, but I think, you know, when you look at some of the fossils like uh, uh, that we found um, in British Columbia early on, they had, there were creatures with, you know, five eyes. So getting really focused on, on five fingers compared to something else is, I think is a very risky area to just be solid on or to, you know, claim to be solid on. It's kind of like it evolved that way. It's like, it was preferred, so to speak. So how many it could have evolved some other way because we how know it, at one point there were other options. Oh yeah. How many eyes did Tully Monstrum have? Two. two. No, just two? Oh, okay. It wasn't that much of a monstrum then. <laughs> but that's bilateral symmetry, right? So a lot of animals sort of uh, are bi bilaterally symmetric. Right. It's funny though that uh, that doesn't uh, always transfer to the insides. Mm. Right. Got a okay. liver on one side and a spleen on the other. But maybe they were lined up in our ancestry. That's an interesting point. Well, at this point in the presentation, I'm going to stop recording. But if Walt is still interested in answering your questions, please uh, hang around for a while. Oh, I'd be happy to. It's not a school night. <laughs>